It would be a lie if I had a full idea of what I'll be sharing tonight. Uh, but I'll kind of start with this. Where the Lord has me in my life, the excuses are no longer working. The can't say it that way. The half-hearted attempts and approaches to obedience isn't suffice. And really, really driving the the party of one where I'm the center of worship is getting kind of my altar's getting knocked down. My golden calf is getting is getting sent to the slaughter. And even last night as I sat there in this sleep study, or actually this morning at 4 a.m., trying to um, maneuver my way into God's presence so that I could fall back asleep was was not working. I was not getting away with. And as I laid there at 4 a.m., you know, trying to spiritualize it, and, you know, and like, Lord, I worship you and I love you and I adore you. And, like, you know, I sound like a 90s R&B album, you know, and, you know, I just might as well just start singing Boys to Men. And the Lord goes, why don't you ask me about why don't you ask me about the person that's helping you tonight? He goes, I really, I really do love her, and I was like, you do, Lord, but I want to go back to sleep. <laughs> it's four a.m. and and he just, why don't you stop thinking about you? Let me tell you about her. I mean, but it's 4 a.m. I don't know if any of you are a fan of 4 a.m. I'm not. But it was 4 a.m. I understand some of us probably go to work at 4 a.m. or have lunch at 4 a.m. And, but that's not me. So, eventually I get my, my mind off myself and... Start paying attention to what the Lord has to say about her. And so, and then he tells me about her, and then, you know, as I'm leaving it, I just say, hey, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the, the hand of God has been on you your whole life. You thought this shadow, this darkness that you were seeing was something evil and wicked, but you've always been under the shadow of the Lord. And she just stops and goes, why are you telling me this? And then, I, you know, in that moment, I'm like, well, this is what the Lord's saying to you. And, you know, then gave a little bit of, of resume. So in that, it's these little areas of our life that have become like little where the little foxes are, are destroying the vines. And we're, we're supposed to be integrated into the, to the vine, the one where life dwells from. And the thing is, is if a vine isn't producing fruit, the vine is dead. And if the vine is dead, you're actually causing, like, it becomes detrimental to the vine itself because what's happening is life is flowing, but then it stop, It goes to where that place that where it's dead, and it's taking life, but not producing anything out of it. But what happens when you have a vine that's no longer producing fruit, that's no longer alive? It gets cut off from the, from the vine, from the main vine. 
And so these areas of our lives where we've, we've, we've blanketed it with ministry and doing good things and all this other busy work, all this other stuff where we've allowed it to take precedence over our life instead of allowing his life to take precedence over our stuff. And so we found ourselves in this quandary we're, we're like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, but there's this, there's this story the father keeps telling the son about three rats in a bucket of cream and eventually one makes butter, but we find ourselves drowning in our own stuff and our own, and our, and our own things. But the, the catch of it all is it's all about us. It's not about him. It's us living out and doing what it is that we want to do and not necessarily fulfilling and doing what it is that he wants to do. And it, but it looks really holy. It looks really spiritual. It looks like something that we should be doing. But in, in the process of or in the journey of developing intimacy with God, the only thing that we can bring of value, of worth, and the only thing that will honestly fit is us. He's not really all that concerned about our accolades or the thing or, you know, it, we feel good when we walk away and we were like, well, I just blessed that person. I gave him a word. Well, I just gave this person $32.28 because the Lord told me to. And so I feel better about it. Yeah, it's kindness. It's love. But is it, have we turned these things about us? About obedience? See, when, when we sing our praises before people, we're living in the reward of that moment right then and instead of allowing the Lord to reward us. But I think he would have something better than we would and what anyone else could offer us. Yeah, I mean, and there's, and there's, and there's times for that. There's times for acknowledging, like you know, if it's literally like, I mean, if if it's a God breathed ministry, and you're like, and you want to show people, hey, this is what I'm doing with the funds that you're giving, you know. But at the same time, <coughs> not every good deed needs to go publicized. Exactly. Don't you know? But if you probably said that today, it would probably be getting ta taken politically. Um, <laughs> I prefer not. Never. There was never a moment for that. Um, I mean, what the what the Lord really desires the most is our heart, all of it, the broken pieces, the the rotted portions. And even the places that we've gold-plated to trick ourselves into thinking that, you know, it's something great. I'll tell you a story a uh, number of years ago. I was, it was a Sunday morning, I think, and we're having church and I'm just worshiping. And I go into this encounter and I see the Lord and he's, he's got like one of those old like, Y'all are going to remember this because you're, because you're teachers or work for a school. But like the, like the cart that you would push where you would have like the VCR or the projector on. He has one of those, but it's full of all these trophies and medals and awards and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing, Lord? He goes, oh, I'm putting it all here in this, in this treasury room. And like I look inside and there's all these gold coins and jewels and chests of treasures and things. All this really beautiful, innate stuff. Like it's just, you know, I'm like, wow. 
you know, this is a, this is really cool. I don't know what any of it is. And I said, well, like what, and I start realizing like what he's doing. I was like, well, you know, cause I ask, what is all this? Oh, these are your badges of honors, your accolades, your, you know, your, all the awards that you've, uh, accumulated over the years and you know the ministry stuff and all this and all your wounds and all the stuff inside your heart everything that's inside your heart and I said oh well, why are you putting it in here he goes oh this is far more valuable to me and I was like okay and so he's like we're putting awards in there and trophies and like, you know, little medals, you know, uh, and we start running out of all that stuff. And now it's like, what, what, what we're, what I'm, I'm, I'm helping him now. I've become his little helper and I'm, you know, I'm handing him these like little Tupperware containers, but inside the Tupperware containers, I can see are rotten pieces of flesh. And I knew it was pieces of my heart that had decayed pieces of my heart that, you know, my vines I have not taken care of type thing. And he goes, oh, these are the most precious to me. And I'm, I am a, I am a puddle outside of this encounter. You know, like I am like a weep thon in my chair. And, and I'm handing him this and he's just like, oh, just give this to me. It's far better with me. It's like, I'll keep it safe here. See, he's after every aspect of our lives, the good, the bad, the ugly, and then the uglier and that stuff that we don't tell people about, the darkness that we get so caught up in the darkness of what we feel like is in our lives that's keeping us from the Lord. But what's really keeping us from the Lord isn't necessarily that darkness. It's the fact that we think it's keeping us from the Lord. And so we distance ourselves instead of him distancing himself from that darkness. And so we've now driven the wedge. And so we're like Adam out in the middle of, you know, nowhere land trying to isolate ourselves because like, why, why would he want something with me? That ugliness. So he'll take every single part as it is. He'll, he'll make, make you whole, but it's in pursuit of him that we get made whole, not in the pursuit of wholeness. I think that's the, one of the biggest, uh, illusions that we as believers suffer from. That if we chase wholeness, we'll become whole. But all we're doing is we're pursuing wholeness instead of pursuing, like, and it sounds cliche, you're, you're pursuing wholeness instead of the one who has holes or the one who can make you whole. But the reality is this, is he, he is everything. And everything else will be added. That's actually one of the scriptures I quoted to the person at, 6 a.m. I was like, you know, you just got to seek, seek the kingdom, you know, because we want to get into this manifest thing and like I'm pursuing after it and, you know, and we start taking scriptures out of context and yeah, it's all, it, it's all pursuing self. Unless they are about the I am. You are, you know. I mean, and uh, having a background, you know, in life coaching and things of that nature, it's like I can, I can jump right into that and point out where, you know, Jesus said that you're the salt of the earth. Like you are a light on a hill, you know. You're a lamp that shouldn't be hidden under a basket. Like these are all great value statements, not great value like Walmart, but like great, they add value to you. But 
we those things still come in the place of him because one word from him can change everything when you begin to see how he sees you it begins to change every aspect of in, the, in which w the way we see others and ourselves because what happens is, is when you capture his eyes or your mind for you you actually begin to step into his mind and his eyes for everyone else and then because you're now when you begin to see his heart his heart and his mind for you and the way he sees you you actually don't even focus on you anymore because you're now stepped into his mind and so you realize that you are are already like him and there's no deficiency in that and so you begin to walk that out but by walking that out what you're looking to do is set someone else free from the same thing that you didn't even realize that you got set free from and that you've become the liberator because the liberator touched you that's always how it was meant to be so when you see someone in bondage when you see someone that's what prophetic ministry is when we're outside the walls of a church when we're outside of the confinements of the, what we would call the brethren but in all reality everybody's the brethren when you begin to look at it because they're all under the you know under God he reconciled all things to himself, not certain things. So anyone could become family. So this pathway to him is way too narrow because we know that the narrow road, the narrow gate is what leads to life. And the context of that scripture is all based around intimacy and knowing him. It's not anything, it's really not anything that deals with sin. It's because you, when, you're, when you're walking down that narrow gate, if sin is on your mind, you're already in it. Because if he doesn't have your, all of your mind, think about it. The moment you focus on not doing something, the moment you find yourself doing it. Paul said that he goes though I you know though I find I don't want to do these things but I find myself doing these things so he's talking about the very things that he doesn't want to find himself doing the whole time but he says I find myself doing them because he's sitting there focusing on that's why he says in Philippians 4 and 4 8 brethren f focus on these things that are pure that are lovely that deserve a praise the things that are like that are praiseworthy of God So in, in pursuing of him, because it's just us, and it's him. And I mean, one of the things that probably should have awoken me up more than anything was a number of months ago, I had, I had a dream where I was following the Lord, but as the Lord kept on going, I couldn't get into the, I couldn't get into the spaces because they were too narrow. And so there's there's only enough room for our, our for our hearts to get through. It's the pathway that leads to intimacy. So that means giving up our right. We well, I have a right to opinion. No, you don't. I have a right to be angry. Not necessarily. Well, they did this. And well, what about my calling? Well, your calling is really to pursue him and just do what he asks you to do. I mean, in being being someone who's been in the the limelight of a, being a young minister, we instantly want to, you know. Our accolades. I got to preach in front of 10,000 people. That's an adrenaline rush. Uh, I mean, I can tell you it is because I've done it. But it's a far crash afterwards, too. You 
And it's hard to suppress that adrenaline thing. I wish they would have told me, hey, don't fall into this, but no. I, and I went in both feet. And so he's, he's really just been on me about just these little things in, in my life of just, you know, even, even in the current stage of my own recovery of, is that the right measurement? Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a few Cheerios over. Is that the right measurement? Are you are you un, are you about to undo everything I did? And it becomes literally a few Cheerios can stretch out my stomach, and then it it defeats the purpose of what I did. It's these it's the little things in our lives that he we go. Well, why do I feel like he's nitpicking me? Because it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. But we've become, we've, we've become settled in those little foxes and those little comforts. Well, it just helps me unwind. Helps me de-stress. I mean, it's just one glass of wine every 13 and a half minutes. You know, but, or whatever it might be. Anything, like, when... We will point the finger at various things and say that they form addictive behavior. We'll go to children, oh, they're playing video games too much. They're, they've become an escapism. So is Instagram for you at 930, mom. Or dad. Or whatever. Anything, anything that we begin to put in the place of the Lord and I'm talking to me, too. Because these, the, these are the things that he's having to deal with in my life. And so in many ways, we can look at whether you want to call it religion. But I don't like to use the word religion because it already has a negative connotation that people attach to it and they go, oh, amen, because they don't realize what's really taking place. And so I, I, I like to kind of word it as Jesus has been deconstructing Christianity since the beginning. Because the, even though the early, believer, the early on believers weren't called Christians, they were, they were part of something called the way that you find in the book of Acts. Historically, that's what they were part of. But he's been deconstructing the way, the way that we lead, lead our spiritual lives so that he could lead us back to him. Think about it for a moment. Like we have, we have this idea that we want to know every, every turn and every moment that God is going to make in our lives. But yet there is absolutely no biblical precedence for that in all of scripture. People would be living their life and then all of a sudden God would tell them to do something. And they had two options, to obey or not obey. But now we want to wait for confirmation. Now, we want to test it out. Now, we want, well, I'm just waiting for the provision to come. What if, what if Noah said, oh, I'm just waiting for rain to come? We've been found a little hard to build a big boat when the rain was already there. But mankind has created their own view on all of this. We've de- created our own doctrines that suit where we're at and where we want to go and where we want to be and how we want to do things and what makes our life easy. 
But Jesus called us to live his ways. I mean, think about it. God delivers the Israelites out of Egypt. They see all this amazing stuff. Moses goes up on a mountain to meet with God. He's gone a little bit longer than they're comfortable with. And God says, will you go get these people? They're already making a golden calf. Let's put it in a situation that maybe... That's realistic. How many of us in here or watching have a promise God has made you? How many of have a promise that God has made us? Something that the Lord has spoken to us that is yet to come to pass. I imagine probably all of us. But in the waiting of that, and while we've been waiting, realistically, honestly, how much scheming have we been doing in the back of our, in the recesses of our mind trying to make this thing happen? If I can just take element B and somehow convert it into Roman numerals to meet up with, Ro with element A, V, multiplied by blue, and we're over here trying to figure it out, doing quantum physics so that we can get what we, we're trying to manipulate and, or we're trying to, uh, it's kind of like we have a giant cauldron in front of us and we're taking all these different spiritual concepts and putting them in a pot and stirring them like we're from Hocus Pocus or something like that and or the wicked. Right in of <laughs> oh, we're going to ascend the heavens in our own accord. Don't get me started on all that. Um, I will anger half of society. Um, <laughs> and all we're doing, we're just out there living our own version of Christian witchcraft. Yeah. You know, because I thought this was just, this was, I guess, religion, or this was the way it was done, because that's the way I was taught. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, tons of people. I mean, there's people that are taught to that to this day. Like, you know, if you don't have what you're looking for, then you can ascend into the spirit realm and war with it. And you wonder why your life is going through hell. Yeah, because. Because you're accessing the heaven through familiar spirits. I mean, but in that, if our if our pursuit of life, our pursuit of the supernatural, is absent of Jesus, then we've neglected the person who is supernatural. It's the, it's the pursuit of, the, of, of spiritual things without Jesus that leads people astray and, into a different form of religion. And they start living in this delusions of grandeur where they're, I'm just super spiritual. Yeah, oh, I know you have. <laughs> I'm very aware. Where, where I was literally told, don't let these people touch me. And I'm just like, Jesus would have. <laughs> but that wasn't received very well. But Probably not. And that happens. Sorry, sometimes things just come out of my mouth. <laughs> but, I mean, Jesus has so many people touching him, and then he, then he goes, who touched me? Um... <laughs> And like the disciples, I would have been like, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. 
Who didn't touch you, dude? I don't know. I wasn't there. But we find ourselves, like when we, we step into this different type of religion or religious activities, and we're now no longer pursuing the Lord. We're pursuing spiritual things. And we can easily go off on tangents about stuff. But there's also a reason for some, there's also a reason that some things need to remain a mystery. It's, and we want to, we want to build monuments to these super moments But when we look at how real intimacy transpires, even if you look at how real intimacy transpires between two individuals, irregardless of the nature of the relationship, whether it's male, male, female to male, whatever, however it is, there's a level of intimacy that transpires between people and but it doesn't happen in big events. It comes over by little by little. It's the small things that lead to true intimacy, not the big moments. Big moments typically transpire because of a lot of little things that transpire. In life coaching, we would tell people, listen, you're going to have probably a hundred micro victories, the victories that nobody's going to see before you have one victory that everybody else notices. But we want other people to see that. Like even, you know, forgive me for always equating everything to where I'm at in my life, but like you have in, in the journey that I'm on, you have what's called a non scale victory or it's things that you just randomly notice that take place that didn't require a, a, a full on like body composition change pardon yeah that's exactly and so as we're pursuing Jesus needs to be the focal point because he is the door and the doorway to the spirit. The spirit without him, it's all divination. He has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father. No one can come into the heavenlies without me. It's through him that we gain access to to the spirit. It's because of what he did that gave us when he became the doorway of salvation, it's what brought us into being able to walk with the spirit. Well, at least the golf is taking one day off for the Lord. It's, I mean, when we, when we, (sighs) 
in certain prophetic and charismatic circles, there are the I'm trying to figure out how to word this. where the the pursuit of the intimacy is for self-gratification where it's for personal gain where it's not necessarily for true intimacy's sake bill johnson i th- and i'm paraphrasing and possibly doing it incredibly no justice but basically said if we're only worshiping or only being intimate with the Lord so that we can do ministry, we've basically have become prostitutes. And that... Well, yeah. I mean, and to a certain degree, real, you know, one thing that Brad really ingrained in me is that... Mi- my ministry is me and him. This is work. This is ministry. This is work. But many people are pursuing ministry occupationally. If you want to see someone get offended real quick when they... Hey, can you help me financially with something? I'm really just out here trying to do ministry. Why don't you get a job? No, the Lord told me I don't need to work. Well, he who loves sleep doesn't eat. Yeah. Now, I don't want this to seem like it's coming across critical because, I mean, there are times where in, in, in pursuing the Lord, he will tell you to do something crazy and radical. And that sometimes will, the other side of that coin that looks exactly like the front side of that coin, but it's a little bit different, is... There will be times where the Lord may tell you, like, hey, you know what? You're done here. And this assignment's over. Any thoughts? Questions? I know I saw a question on the chat here. So, a question that someone asked here on the broadcast is, would you are sons and daughters be a statement that mirrors him because it's how he sees us? And that would be yes, because he was his only begotten son. So when he speaks that you are sons and daughters, it's how he, is, it's how he sees us. We are like him. So, I mean, when we're walking with him, when we're in that place of intimacy, we become the encounter. You know, we all we we know that song. When you walk into the room, everything changes. The sickness begins to fade. And, you know, resurrection life comes in. Is that not you too? Not the band. Don't you dare do it. But. But is that, if you're made in His image. When you walk into a room, everything begins to change.
which then goes, where are our minds when we walk into a room? Yes, they're on that you need to get eggs and butter and, <laughs> but something to just become aware of is just when you walk into somewhere, walk in with the Lord. Walk in, he's inside of you. Arise and shine, you know, we always quote the scripture. I mean, how many times are we going to prophesy over ourselves until we, until we live it? Because the greatest, the greatest gift we can give anyone is always going to be Jesus. Like, prophetic words are cool. Words of knowledge are great. And we can conjure those up on our own. But when we give someone Jesus in that moment, when we really tap into who he is. We can, we're giving life. We're giving resurrection power. We're bringing healing. Like even this morning, even though, even though the woman was like, why are you telling me this? She goes, you have no idea how much I needed to hear this. I said, you're absolutely right, I don't. I have no idea. I'm just a I'm just a messenger. <laughs> and all it takes is one second. One second. I mean if think about it for a moment if someone could be that has dealt with an issue for most of their life touch the fringe of his garment. And be made whole. Now, I don't associate the fringe of the garment with us in a practical manner. Something just as simple as an act of kindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember I was liv living in Sacramento at the time and I walked into what probably now is a Walgreens but then it wasn't and the, the girl behind the cash register you know just I was just making chit chat conversation normally I'm you know I'm like you know we're all in our own head while we're doing life and I'm just and I go, oh, how are you doing? Oh, no, she goes, hey, you know, how are you doing today? Like, she's doing the normal customer service thing. And I'm like, I'm doing all right. How about yourself? She goes, oh, I'm good. And I was like, mm, no, she's not. I said, can I tell you something? She goes, what? I said, you're a horrible liar. But I have a way of, like, communicating sometimes that, like, it, it not, it's not confrontational. But like I was like, you're you're a horrible liar. You're not having that good of a day, are you? She goes, No, I'm not. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, you know, uh, nothing crazy. I hope your day gets better. She and she goes, you know what? It just did. It just takes a moment. And it doesn't have to be, you know, Lord, I call down your joy. That's weird. But it can be. <laughs> but we become that encounter to somebody at any given moment. At any random time, we can become that encounter. We can change someone's life just by the way that we wave, by the way that we love them, by the way we tell them, hey, it's okay if you have to go to work. I understand. Glad you made it. We're praying you get another car. Yeah, but then, but she can stay.
but it's with with all of that and one of my favorite quotes God has factored our stupidity into the equation and I'm very thankful for that pardon it really is it really is a long mathematical formula but I mean when you think about the disciples around Jesus they had about as much intelligence sometimes as this bottle cap <laughs> sometimes and they cause all sorts of issues they rarely understood Jesus I mean like rarely understood anything that he was saying or doing like I don't know if you've ever seen the show The Chosen but like you know when they're going out to like the field of like Samarita uh, and they're like why is he sending us out there like, oh, it's because we work fields so good. <laughs> you know, like, they have no grid <laughs> at all. And it's absolutely hilarious and adorable. And I imagine if that was with Jesus today, he would have had a Costco-sized bottle or a Sam's Club-sized bottle uh, of Advil for that headache. I mean... Yeah, we're, we're out there doing some crazy stuff, you know. Uh, my favorite, my favorite, like, little joke is uh, at Eleanor's old school, she would always go, well, I told him the fruit of the spirit, <laughs> you know, and not see, not, like, there's a change happening, but we don't always see it right there. You know, and but or you know, or drive by exorcisms or whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, but the disciples were trying to set people on fire. Did we forget that? Should we call down fire upon them? They're not with like all of a sudden, like they're in a gang, they're like, Hey, what's up, fool? What are they? You know. Yet Peter Peter was a little trigger happy with his sword. John had an anger issue. Peter was, you know, quick tempered. I mean, after every single parable. What does that mean? <laughs> we don't get it. Thomas doubted. Thomas doubted. But in the end, they loved him. And he loved them. So even though we may be a mess at times, He can handle it. I'll share this and kind of close with it. A number of years ago, I was driving home. And I was not happy. At all. I was, I was quite angry about something. I can't ever tell you what. I have no idea. But it was one of those days where, like, you don't even want music on. And so I was like, I'm just going to turn the music off, and I'm going to try to focus on the Lord. Because if not, I'm going to focus on destroying something. <laughs> and uh, as I'm driving, I go into this encounter. And I'm on Highway 80 in, in Northern California, going from Northern northern california to uh still northern california just 30 miles south and as i'm driving i go into this encounter and i'm with jesus and we're dancing upon the sea of glass 
and we're, I mean, it, how do you, you got one man dancing, you know, how do you explain all that? But, uh, so we're dancing, and I step on his toes. And if that's not a story about my life, I step on his toes. And he looks at me with eyes of compassion and kind of laughing. And he says, you know what? Don't worry about it. I've been dancing for quite a while. And we just continued on dancing. He can handle the mess we make. When other people aren't able to handle it, he can. Don't count them off. Don't write them off. So sometimes we're in a mess, we're in a funk, we're in a process, and they may not know may not know how to handle it. But he does. But those are kind of my random thoughts for the night. And I think from what I can tell, from what I feel or hear, is God's not allowing us to stay the same anymore. And he's forcing, in a sense, a change for us to come out of our ways of doing things and our own knowledge and back into life in the Spirit. Because the Spirit gives life. And that's where we need to be.